So we are in this sermon series called Serve, and if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, um, you know, the, really the heart behind it is we want you to serve, serving like Jesus. Uh, the reason why we want you to serve like Jesus is because Jesus Christ himself was God, and he didn't come to sit on a throne to be served, but rather he says that he came to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. So he's our greatest example of service. We serve because we want to be like him. So we want to serve like him, and we also want to serve him, right? Because he's our master. Masters have servants. So we do want to serve him. We want to serve one another also. And we want to serve those outside the church. So in a nutshell, that's a lot of service if you think about it. And yet typically most churches kind of default inwardly where we just want to sit and we just want to listen. And that's, that's no fault to the church, to you guys. That's just kind of how the church has uh, evolved over time. It, that, but that's not biblical. That's, you can't find that in the scriptures. So I'm going to do my best without trying to, to persuade you. I'm just going to do my best to look through the scriptures and let God's word speak for itself when it comes to serving. Uh, but that's where we're going in the sermon series. And today we're going to talk about this topic the priesthood of all believers. How many of you have ever heard that term, the priesthood of all believers? How many of you have ever heard of the term priesthood or priest? So when you think of priest, probably some things come to mind, right? Especially if you grew up in a certain denomination. I, I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, so when I heard of the word priest, a couple of things actually came to my mind, okay? And, and one of those things was, and I'll give you a couple of examples of what might come to your mind. I'll start off with number three. They, they dress differently, right? I mean, most time the priest wore these robes or they wore the black shirts with the little collar. They, you could tell the priest or the nuns uh, from other people, right? And also, um, number one, it says they gave up things, they took some vows. They took these vows of poverty, right? So they were never going to go out and make a lot of money. They were going to trust that God's people would take care of their needs, right? Um, they took a vow of chastity. So that meant they would never get married and they would never have kids. Are you familiar with these things, these sacrifices that these men have made, right? Um, what, how many of y'all would think those are sacrifices? That, yeah, those are like, man, I... Especially being Father's Day, right? We, we, you know, they can never have the opportunity to, to know what it's like to be a father. And yet, it's interesting, the title that they have is what? Father. Most of the time, it's, it's father. I, I remember this, this movie, uh, Rudy. How many of y'all saw that movie, Rudy? Best inspirational movie of all times. There's a scene in the movie, Rudy, where he wants to go play football for, for UT Austin. Notre Dame, right? Rudy wants to play for Notre Dame. That's all, all he wants. And so there's a scene in the movie where his best friend dies at the plant. They're working at the plant together. So he's like, this is it. This is my time. I got to go. If I don't go now, I'll never, ever make it to Notre Dame. So he doesn't really necessarily want to just go to graduate from Notre Dame. He wants to go play football at Notre Dame. So he gets there early in the morning. The, the guard is like, hey, I'm sorry. The campus is closed. Nobody can see you. He said, well, is there anyone that can see me? And he goes, yeah, come on in. I, 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 I know somebody will see you. And he goes and meets with a priest. Do you remember the scene? And so he's there early in the morning, and the priest thinks he wants to become a priest. And he's like, Father, he said, you know, I, I know the sacrifice it's going to take. I know the commitment it's going to take, and I'm ready for this. He's thinking football, you know. And the priest is listening to him, and the priest's like, son, you don't realize the commitment that it takes to become a priest. And he's like, wait a second. I don't want to become a priest. I want to play football at Notre Dame. And he's like, well, I can't help you. Let me direct you to somebody who can help you. The point is, is that s- priests make sacrifices, right? And Rudy's like, hey, I can't make that kind of sacrifice. I can go out and play football for Notre Dame, Division I, but becoming a priest, there's no way in the world I could ever do that. And many of us would say the same thing. Many of us would say there's no way in the world we could honestly say we can give up those types of things and make those types of sacrifices. And yet, every day there are men who join the priesthood and women who join the nunnery, 
the nunhood? I don't know what it's called. The nun, to become a nun. Convent. Yeah. Not to be confused with your relatives that went to their convicts. No, I'm just kidding. We're friends. I can say that. <laughs> so number two is this is the other one. They also served as mediators bef- between a holy God and sinful people. You've, you've heard of that before? Let me give you an example. When I grew up as a, as a Roman Catholic, so when I made my first Holy Communion, we had to go and do our confession. Some of y'all may have grown up in this. And what we would do is we would go into a confession booth with a priest, and we would begin to confess our sins to the priest, right? And the priest would listen to our, our, our sins, and then he would give us what's called a penance. Go and say these, these prayers. And after you say these prayers, then you will be forgiven. Now, how many of y'all have heard of this to some degree, right? Y'all, y'all familiar with this? Okay. The Bible talks about these things. The Bible talks about priests and wearing different kinds of clothes and that they sacrifice and they serve and they... Uh, function as mediators and so between a sinful humanity and a holy God so so the priesthood is not too far-fetched from what we find in the Old Testament but today I'm going to actually take you on a journey before the priesthood was ever established and you're going to see that just ordinary guys in the very beginning functioned as priests Ordinary people just like you and just like me function as priests before the priesthood of believers was ever, uh, before the priesthood was ever established. Then I'm going to take you briefly to Israel, and you're going to see that there is a priesthood in the Old Testament. And then I'm going to point you to Jesus, because Jesus ultimately is the high priest. And after Jesus, then you're going to see that now, once again, every person in this room can serve as a priest, not necessarily with the robes or the collars or the confessional booths, but yet every one of us, as the Bible says, can serve as a priesthood of believers. So if you get lost in this, don't worry about it. This is a lot of information, and I will do my best to try to keep it simple so we can track along. But let's take a look today. Um, Let's take a look at some examples in the Old Testament before the actual priesthood was established. So here's a quick little history lesson. In Genesis chapter 3, something major happens to humanity, and it is sin, right? If y'all have been coming to this church long enough, you realize that God created all things good. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, everything is good. Genesis 3, man rebels against a holy God. And by rebellion, I mean he says one thing, they do the opposite. That's called sin. That's called being disobedience. That's called no longer being under one's authority. You've, you've gone rogue. You've rebelled against your master. And this is what Adam and Eve did in the beginning. Y'all familiar with that part, right? All right. So in this process, Adam and Eve understand that they did something wrong, right? It could Because the result is they went and they hid in their shame, right? In fact, the Bible tells us in, in, in Genesis that they actually took some fig leaves and they began to sow fig leaves and they began to cover themselves up because they knew they were naked, right? But do you remember what happens after that? God does something. Hold on a second. Before, before you go too far in this, this dialogue, remember, God does something. God provides for them what? Coverings. What kind of coverings? Animal skin. In other words, a sacrifice took place. Not by humans. Humans didn't, didn't offer up a, the first sacrifices. But God himself was the one who initiated the sacrifice of animals, and he gives them now animal coverings to wear, to cover up. So the very first sacrifice is not ever done by us, but rather it's done by God himself. Speaking of which, God himself is a father, right? Adam and Eve have no birth parents. He is their father. He is the one who is taking care of them. He knows that they've sinned, and he's already making provisions through these animal coverings 
With that being said, now I'm going to show you in Genesis chapter 4, two sons, Cain and Abel, right? They offer up sacrifices, do they not? In Genesis 4, they go before a holy God and they bring forth their offerings to God, right? They are functioning, in a sense, as a priest because priests are the ones who offer up sacrifices. And so here's two ordinary guys, Cain and Abel, and they offer up sacrifices to God. And guess what happens? God accepts one of their sacrifices, and he rejects another one. And because of this, Cain is mad at his brother, and he takes him out to the field, and we see in Scripture the very first murder between brothers because of a sacrifice. One was accepted, and one was rejected. So in a sense, they function as priests. There's no priesthood yet, right? Because I'll get to the real priesthood in a second. But you got to just, like, track with me. Genesis 8. Y'all have heard of this guy named Noah. Noah builds a what? Builds an ark, a boat. He, there's a flood, right? He is told to take animals of every kind, two of every kind, male and female, so they can procreate, repopulate the earth, right? But he also was told to bring extra animals for sacrifices. So once, once the, the water subsides and the ark is on dry ground, now the very first thing we see Noah do is he offers up sacrifices to God he's functioning as a priest priests offer sacrifices to God right are you tracking okay a few chapters later a guy by the name of Abraham right father Abraham had many sons many sons father Abraham y'all know that song okay Abraham does something the scriptures tell us and you can check these out if you don't believe me Genesis 12 verse 7 he builds an altar to the Lord and he offers up sacrifices. He himself is functioning as a priest. There's no priesthood yet. Average guys, Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, are functioning as priests. Now, it's interesting. Abraham also offers up one big sacrifice, and he's going to sacrifice his what? His son, his only son. That's right. He's going he's gonna to sacrifice. He's functioning again as a priest. So one last guy in the Old Testament before we get to the Levitical priesthood who was an ordinary guy, and yet he functioned as a priest. Here it is. Are you familiar with this guy by the name of Job? So Job, in Job chapter 1, I would encourage you to, to read. It's a long book, but I would encourage you to just to start reading this. It's a narrative. But in Job chapter 1, I want you to pay close attention to, to the narrative. Job chapter 1, verse 1 says this, In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God, and he shunned evil. Now, he had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, had a large number of servants, and he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. So the narrative tells us a little glimpse of Job. Is he wealthy? Is he great among the people of the East? And his character is what? He's blameless, and he's upright, and he shuns evil. So this would be, in today's standards, if you looked at some of the billionaires of this world, pick any billionaire you want. Oftentimes, we, we like, man, I wish we were like those guys. They got power, they got prestige, they got money, they got success, they got everything they want. But we, never rare, we rarely hear about their spiritual life. Job had everything, but his most important asset was his relationship with God. How do I know? Watch this. Verse 4. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. 
This was Job's regular custom. He was their dad to adult children. He was the priest of his home. You know, as, as my kids get older, I'm going to tell you, I've discovered it's harder to be a dad when, when my kids get older. I don't know if some of you who are older dads can relate to this, but when you always say it's hard when they're little, but when they're little, you can put them in timeout, you can correct their behavior, you can put them in the room, you can take away video games, you can ground them, you can do whatever needs to be done right then and there. But when they're older and they leave the home, it's a whole nother story. And Job didn't know exactly what his kids were doing when they were off on alone celebrating these birthdays. But Job, as the priest of his home, would regularly get up in the morning and he would intercede as a priest to his kids. I'm learning to do this as, as a dad with, with one teenager and a preteen and a 20-something, soon to be 21. My whole view of fatherhood has just changed dramatically. My 8-year-old, man, it's still pretty easy until he turns to be a teen or leaves the house also. But I would tell you guys, being at Father's Day, this is probably the application that you all need to hear. If you are a dad in this place, praise God, because ultimately God is the father that we want to model after, the father to the fatherless. He's our, our Abba. But if you are a dad and God has placed you as a dad over kids and they're still in the home, your job is to be priest over, their ho- over your home. Your job is to lead your kids, sacrifice some things that you would want to do. It takes a lot to be a dad, right? When my kids were little and, and, you know, and I was first married, man, I wanted to do things like a single guy would do. I wanted to go out and play golf for three and a half hours, and those days were gone. Some of you all played golf with me, and you're like, man, you're terrible. It's because I haven't played in 20 years. Sacrifice, right? Some of you, some of you, some of you dads, some of you dads understand what sacrifice means because you drive a minivan. <laughs> sacrifice, you know, sports car. That, that, now I know why guys said midlife crisis because they're like, I need a sport. I need a, I used to be cool. Job was a priest to his home. Now, if you're a dad in here this morning, I want to just encourage you to be the head over your home under Jesus and point your kids to Jesus while they're still in the home. Now, some of you in here are single moms. I would tell you the same thing. I would tell you that the priesthood, if if your husband is not a, a, a man of God, then I would tell you to step into those shoes to lead your home because somebody needs to lead those kids to the Lord and if you are a single mom especially you have that role and responsibility because your kids need you to point them to Jesus I'll give you an example some of you know the story when I was at first a youth youth pastor 20 plus years ago there was this um, youth group that I led in in uh, Castroville in um, Carrollton Texas so most of the kids would come to our Bible study Sunday morning, and they were church kids. No offense to church kids. I got church kids in my house. They grew up in the church. But this is kind of the attitude of the church kids. They would show up and like, yeah, my mom and dad made me come to Bible study. I don't want to be here, you know. But there was these two boys that showed up, walked in. How you doing, sir? I was like, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Tall, six-foot tall young men. And one of them was Josh. His brother's name was Jared. One was a senior. One was a, a sophomore. Both of them played quarterback for the, for the football team. And, man, when a girl walked in the room, they would stand up. And, when, you know, when somebody would walk by, they would open the door. And I was like, guys, you know, how did you all learn to be such a gentleman? And they said, well, our mom taught us. They said, we grew up without a dad. And as we would have the Bible studies, they're the ones that knew a lot of the scriptures that we would read. And I was like, how did y'all know so much about the word of God? And they said, every morning before we would go to school, our mom would make us breakfast. And our mom would open up the word of God to us. And we would read a chapter every day. And so over the course of their 18 years of growing up, these men were godly men with no real male spiritual influence in their life because their mom stepped into those shoes. 
We can make excuses. We can say, well, our kids are, you know, whatever the case might be. But guys, what's more important than raising your kids like Job and pointing them to God? Nothing. I want you guys to go out and teach your kids how to throw the ball, how to ride a bike, how to bait a hook, how to drive a car. But God didn't put you on earth just to do those things. He put you on this earth so that you can point your kids to Jesus and that you could pray over your kids as a priest in your home. And you can also, when they leave the home, you can also be interceding on behalf of them because you don't know what they're doing, but God does, and you can go on behalf of the, go into the throne of God and ask for blessings and protection for your kids. Amen? So, Old Testament, there was no priesthood in the early days. But in the book of Exodus, something happens. Exodus 28. Now, you remember, Moses is the guy who leads the people out of Egypt. They're going to the promised land. He's got a brother. So without giving you too many details, God chooses. Let's read the scriptures. Exodus 28 says this. Have Aaron, your brother, he's talking to Moses, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons, Nadab, Abu, Eleazar, and that guy, Ithmar. And so they may, they may serve, so they may serve me as, what's the word? So here, God is going to establish the priesthood. And he's going to choose Moses' brother named Aaron. And if you follow the genealogy, they are Levites. It's going to be the Levitical priesthood. And he says in verse 2, Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron, for his consecration, so he may serve me as what? Priest. So now you got a guy who is an official clergy member and along with his sons and along with their descendants are going to be the official priests of all Israel. They're going to dress differently. They're going to have a high priest. The high priest is a person who would go into the Holy of Holies once a year to offer up an atonement for the nation. And there was a lot of things that they had to do. And so this is where, I guess, in America we get the priesthood and we model this after this Old Testament custom because it's right then, there in black and white, is it not? But, but follow me, for example, for example, for a second. When you get to the New Testament between Exodus 28 and between Hebrews 4, you have what's called the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you see the the story of Jesus who was born, right? And he lives a sinless life. And Jesus Christ goes to the cross and Jesus dies. And you know what the book of Matthew records when he dies? Something happens to the temple curtain. When he dies, the temple curtain, there's an earthquake and the temple curtain is torn. You know why that's, that's important? Because before that that happened you could not go into the the temple holy of holies you couldn't go in there a priest would have to go in there on behalf of you on behalf of the nation but once that temple curtain tore and now said that everybody has access to god through jesus christ because jesus christ is our high priest now hebrews 4 tells us this therefore since we have a great high priest referring to jesus who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. A lot of information there. Here's what I want you to see. Our high priest Jesus, according to Hebrews, never sinned. Got to break it to you. you. You, Society elevates pastors 
I got to break it to you. Pastor sin. We elevate nuns. I got to break it to you. Nun sin. We elevate priests. I got to break it to you. They sin. Evangelist. Billy Graham, former, you know, was a former evangelist here in the United States. He sinned. The Pope. Uh oh. He sins. He sins. There's only one that has ever walked this earth who has never sinned, and that is Jesus Christ, who now is our high priest, fully God and fully man. Because of him, we have now access to the throne room of heaven because and only him. That's our high priest. He has now opened up the doors for you, me, to approach the throne of God. It says it right there. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. You can now go and pray to God. That's important for us, guys. Let me take it one more step. Y'all have heard of guys like Peter, Paul, James, John, Philip, Andrew, those apostles, right? The early church guys, Timothy, Titus, all those guys. You, you familiar with those guys? Nowhere in the New Testament are they referred to as priests. They're referred to as Pastors, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Something changed when Jesus Christ died and he becomes our high priest. We no longer need the priesthood like we used to have under Israel's time. The church is different. In fact, Ephesians 4 tells us that there are offices in the church. Ephesians tells us this. He says that he, Jesus, gave some to be apostles to be prophets, to be evangelists, to be shepherds, and to be teachers. But the roles of us as clergy now is not to be holier than thou, but is to equip you all for the works of service. That's the role of the pastor is to equip you so that you can serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, Peter says this in his letter, you also like living stones, referring to the body of Christ, okay? Here's the, here's the distinction. We talk about putting up a building on 471 as our church building. That is not the church. That is a building made of steel, okay? The church is you all. You and I are the church. It's not a building. It is the body of Christ. In fact, Peter says you, like living stones, are being built into these spiritual houses. Why? Here it is. To be a holy priesthood. Now you all and myself are, off, are to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now what does this mean? This is what it means. It means that you and I now don't need to sit around and wait for some professional clergy to do the work of the ministry. That God has entrusted each and every one of us to do the work of ministry ourselves. I know that's a foreign concept. I know it, but it's biblical. I'll give you some examples. You know you have the ability and the right to open up God's word for yourself, to read God's word for yourself. I mean, you know, we live in a time period that has been, it's, it's the greatest time period of all to ever live. Before the... The, the printing press, there was only a few books of the Bible, and they were, you know, held by the church. And you had to depend upon somebody to tell you what the Bible said. And in the earliest days of the church, the services were done in Latin. And if you didn't speak Latin, you didn't know what they were talking about. My parents uh, in the 60s would go to church and they didn't speak Latin, and the services were done in Latin, and they would just sit there, and they would listen. And it sounded good, and I'm sure whatever the, the priests were saying was good, but they didn't hear it. You ever heard Latin? Latin's beautiful. You hear the Gregorian chants? Those are beautiful things, but you don't know what they're saying. And so here's the thing. You, 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 some of you older people like myself, you remember this group in the 90s called... Um, Cademan's Call. Cademan's Call. Y'all familiar with Cademan's Call? 
Uh, some of you younger people, Google Cademan's call. So Cademan was a priest. And Cademan, was his, it was his turn to, to give the message to the people. And he felt God was giving him a call to do something different. He felt God was giving him a call to speak to the people in their native language. Because he said they don't understand Latin. Cademan had a call from God to speak in a language that the people could understand, and he did it. That was Cademan's call. When this band started, they wanted to make music different. They wanted to reach a, a, a genre or generation of young people that felt like our music is different from your dad's music type thing, and so we want to speak their language. This is what Cademan did, is that he opened up the Word of God. Now, for you, you don't need me to, 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 you shouldn't be dependent upon me every week for God's word. You have the ability to read your word every day. Even if it's just a little devotion, you can get into God's word every day. You can. What about praying? You know, a lot of times you still feel like you need to ask me for prayer requests, and I will pray for you. Don't get me wrong. I will pray for you. The Bible tells in the book of James that a prayer of a righteous man availeth much, but it doesn't say the prayer of a clergy. It says the prayer of a righteous man. There are righteous men and women in this church that if you need prayer, they will pray for you. But do you pray for people? Do you pray for You should. What about sharing the gospel? A lot of times people bring people to church and say, Pastor, convert them. You know? Pastor, why don't we have altar calls? Pastor, we need an altar call. Pastor, some of y'all have thought that here. Right? Maybe not. Amen. I'm going to tell you, search the scriptures. There's no such thing as an altar call. I'm not opposed to altar calls, but don't get caught up on an altar call. You know what the Bible tells us to do instead? is to you and I to be the ones that share the good news with people, not just on a Sunday morning, but anywhere we go, we are to carry the good news of Jesus to the world. You know, that's why we're going out to have Jesus in Java. Can I just take a moment and tell you how this took place? First of all, we've been praying for Castorville. I've been praying for Castorville for about two years now. My, my wife teaches there. My kids go to school there. I live in Medina County. Some of you know when we meet for our meetings, we meet in Castroville. Because I'm there trying to develop relationships. I'm there trying to get to know the community. Maki and I have, have gone out a, a couple of times, and we've walked through by apartment complexes. We, we've went by the police station. We, I know I've met the mayor. I know the superintendent. I, I know a lot of that community, but a lot of you guys don't know that community you don't live in that community what we want to do as a church we're moving there i can't be the only one that's trying to minister we need all of us to go and try to be the hands and feet of jesus because we're the church all of us are and so here's here's kind of how it happened i was at a coffee shop in in magnolia filling station and and i met the new owner and the new owner um i i called jenny and i said jenny i said just man you got to meet this girl this girl is like a very neat lady. So Jenny goes and meets her. Sandy goes and meets her. And they're like, man, she's the neatest person. And you know what? Somehow we were talking and God put it on my heart. Can I share this, Jenny? God put it on. Good, I'm going to share it anyway. <laughs> God put it on my heart. We should just do something there. We should, like, have a night of praise and, and just, like, coffee and, you know, desserts. And the lady's on board. What do you think about it? I think it's great. So I tell Jen, because we obviously got to have Jen on board, and Jen goes out there and meets her and has coffee, and then Jen finds out that this lady needs prayer, and Jen's like praying for her business and for her and for her family, and this is like amazing. Why do I say that? It's because the pastor wasn't the guy doing all the praying for the people. Jen was, and then now we're going to go and have coffee and sing songs, invite friends, and hopefully she's going to promote it to Castorville. And hopefully there's going to be people there on the patio at 8 o'clock at night drinking coffee, eating desserts. And we're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Don't be like pushy. You know, turn to burn. You're going to hell. You know, we're not. <laughs> we're developing relationships, you know. And sh talk to people. 
hear their story. And guess what? When you take the time to hear someone's story, can I pray for you? Because it sounds like, you know, you got something that maybe I can pray for. Or, you know, thank you for sharing your story. Can I share my story? Let me tell you a little bit about our church, a little bit. And just casually tell them, and you're pointing them to Jesus. But I would ask you guys to be praying for that. Praying for the parade. We're doing a float. It's in July. I know, Pastor, there, how that's not biblical to do a float in the parade. <laughs> you know? But we're passing out koozies. Pastor, that's not biblical either to pass out koozies. You know, I get it. But what we're doing is letting people know we're here. Because they don't know we're there. We're here. And three months from now, Lord willing, we're going to be there. And so as God opens up doors, let us look for those opportunities to bridge the community to God. Number four, you now can serve. Every one of you in this room, if you are a follower of Jesus, guess what? You can serve. You can serve Sunday morning, and I'll be, I'll be honest with you. God has provided for us every year over the last 11 years. But there are seasons in our life where key families go to different places. They go all around the world, especially with the military. But God keeps bringing new folks in to replace them. But here's the reality. This summer, some of our key families are moving. There's going to be some opportunities for people to serve. And you might say, it's not that, you know, serving, you know. I, but I'm telling you, this piece of our puzzle, the gather, is a big piece. This is our Sunday morning worship. It takes a lot of hands and feet to make a Sunday morning worship work. Greeters, if you can smile, then you can greet. If you're grumpy, we'll find another ministry for you. <laughs> you know, because the greeter is the first person that they encounter. Hey, come on in. We're, you know, here's some coffee. We'd love to. Thank you. We're glad you're here. We, we need greeters. Children's ministry is our largest ministry. We need some more teachers and workers who love Jesus, who love kids. There is a background check. We, we take safety seriously. So if you're a felon, don't apply. You know? <laughs> Gosh, I'm bad at my jokes. Misdemeanors, maybe. No. But in all honesty, we do take our safety seriously and we'll continue to take our safety seriously audio visual they need help if you can flip a slide dude we got a place for you to serve setting up taking down singing prayer ministry if you want to be a small group leader you know, there's some higher qualification. The higher the ministry responsibility goes, is it's higher. But there's always a place for anyone to serve in this church. We're never going to say, no, you can't serve. We'll find a place for you to serve. And at some point, we're going to need a parking ministry. That's not biblical. I know you can't find that in the spiritual gift. But, but somewhere in there, we're going to need somebody to point people where to park because we're parking on land. All right. The last one is this. Now you can sacrifice. You know what Romans 12 says? Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer what? Somebody finish that for me. To offer, you offer yourselves. So we don't need another animal sacrifice. We got the ultimate sacrifice is Jesus. Jesus is our sacrifice of all sacrifices. What he requires for us now is to walk in obedience, to offer up our lives as living forms of worship, that we're here for you, Lord. M more of you, less of me. I am yours, God. That's what we're here for now.